feel like I lost my moderators while they went to work on the slides. <coughs> Hello, hey, everyone. Hey, hey. I hear you're having uh, great times in here. <laughs> it's a little meditative space, thinking about stuff. More people keep <laughs> dropping in, that's great. So I'm just going to tell you my DIY tips that I did today. I've been in the um, Bell headset a lot this week because of this great conference. And um, it's heavy on my cheeks. So I have some cotton balls and I stuffed them under my headset on my cheeks. And I'm feeling very clever for doing that. <laughs> can we call you cotton cheeks? You can call me cotton now. <laughs> I'll give hey, you <laughs> Just going to give this a couple of minutes while we try to figure out the slides thing. Is there anything y'all think I should do? Should I go back to the uh, my home and then come back here or what? So what's happening with the slides? Hello. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, They're Eric. just completely stuck. Um, what is... Look. Is it slides.com or is it Google? Google Slides. Um, so I guess we and, refresh, refresh um, the browser. Okay. Yeah, let's try so refreshing the browser. Sec. Could I just resend the link to Ed to uh, the summit? Where did I send it to? Okay, I, I sent it to summit at educatorsinvr.com, so we could try that. Eric? Sure. They I said they were going to try something whatever. new with they these asked slides. To come and do it, but maybe whatever. that was. Right, so Nina, is it frozen on your screen right now? Yes, it screen? is just a white screen now. Should I turn around and try to click the front screen? There we go. Okay. There we go. Hey, audience, if you can oh, see the screen, sweet. can you give us a round of heart emoji so we know you can see it? Okay. Um. Ooh, people getting to see all preview of my slides there. Okay, all right. Uh, you can go ahead. Should we get started? Do I get an intro or do I do my own bad self? Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay, hello, audience, 805. Yeah, that's pretty good, just five minutes set up. Awesome. Um, yeah, smile. Um, thank you for coming this late night. It might be very early in Europe, but I appreciate it. And I'm excited to talk about this. Um, <coughs> we're going to do a deep dive into the differences between STEM education and VR versus 2D PC. All right. So, I guess... I'll is, is, Lo is someone here to advance the slides? Can I say next slide and that'll happen? There we go. I'm Mina Johnson Glenberg. I'm a research professor at Arizona State University and I wear a second hat. I'm also the founder of a spin out company called Embodied Games. And um, we specialize, if you go to the next slide, in making um, educational games for like fourth graders, lifelong learners. And you know, my big shtick is that I care a lot about STEM and I care about teaching uh, girls and underrepresented minorities about uh, STEM content. And uh, um, I've recently gotten into XR in a big way. Um, actually, I was just waiting for it to come of age, and so that's very exciting, right? That XR is here. We've got you know straight to consumer headsets, so I'm really excited to just throw all my energies into making great XR content for anyone who wants to learn STEM. Um, what I'd like to focus on today are some of the recent randomized control trials that have been published on STEM learning outcomes comparing the virtual reality uh, immersive headsets and 2D PC platforms. Next slide. 
and you think there'd be more though, right? I think they're about to start coming out, like a whole spate of them will come out soon, but they've, they, there's not that many to date. I, I only picked about seven to focus on. But before I jump into that, let's talk about what makes learning with VR special, right? Because not everything should be in VR. VR has certain affordances, and we propose that there are two profound affordances that help STEM learning. The first one, and actually these have been published in an article uh, in Frontiers in Psychology, so you can go there, there's the link. Or if you just type in Johnson Glenberg Frontiers, hopefully you'll find it. Next slide. And so we propose affordances, and the first affordance I think everyone will agree with is this idea of presence, right? And so you can connect so deeply with the content. Also, presence and being in 360 allows you so many different viewpoints of the content from the canonical, that makes sense, to just odd points of view. And that's really special as well. Another thing that's kind of cool is that you're isolated from the outside world when you're in the headset. And when we took some uh, Go headsets to a high school in downtown Phoenix uh, a few months ago, a teacher said, this is the first time I've seen that kid without his earbuds in, right? Because, you know, kids today, there's just so much input from the environment and the world that to get out of that and into a headset that's all inclusive and all enclosed is actually a profound thing. It makes them really focus on the content. So that's one of the amazing things about uh, VR. Next slide. The second profound affordance has to do with how you can uh, manipulate content in the, in the virtual space. Um, so this is a slide I grabbed from Nano. They do some really amazing stuff with chemistry and molecules, and that's a good use case, right? I underlined these words, embodied manipulation of content in 3D, because each of these concepts is important. The embodiment, using your physical body and gesture to manipulate things. The manipulation, moving around in 360, taking uh, something from in front of you, moving it behind you, that's important. And just the kinesthetics of moving your body are important to learning. And then the idea of being in three dimensions is special. So all of those come together to make this a second profound affordance. Next slide. And before I go deeper, let me just take a few minutes to talk about what is embodiment and education. So the mind and the body are inextricably linked. There's lots of research showing that the body can help us learn by using gesture or using full body movements. If you read any of uh, Susan Golden Meadows' corpus on learning math, um, there's like a decade and a half of research showing that the body helps us learn, even going back to Maria Montessori, who was a big proponent of using the hands. Um, we've proposed a, um, uh, a taxonomy for the amount of embodiment in an educational module. And there are three axes to this, right? The first axis would be, does it, does it increase the feeling of uh, immersion and presence? The second is, is there congruence to the gesture, right? Is there meaningful congruence? So if I'm teaching you about gears, I want to make something where your hand is spinning like this. That's a meaningful, congruent gesture to learning about the rotation of a gear. And finally, the third axis might be magnitude of gesture. Are bigger gestures better than smaller gestures? And that's a research world that um, people need to look at more. We know that incongruent gestures hurt learning, but we don't know about the magnitude of gesture. So uh, VR affords us bigger gestures if we're just holding the hand controls and so it's kind of a cool new world out there that could be researched should be researched next slide so what does it mean i'll go into each of these terms with an, with one more slide each right so what does it mean to manipulate with gesture right if you're manipulating content it's going to be so cool that we can now do it with our favorite natural user interface, the hand, the human hand. You don't even have to hold a hand controller. Like if the Quest hand control stuff works out, it'd be so, you know, it'd be great to just put your hand in front of your, you know, headset and have it immediately be tracked. And this is a little slide I grabbed from Wikipedia because this is one of my favorite, you know, physics examples of what you can do with the hand. Is the right hand rule for looking where the magnetic field is coming off of a coil. So the direction of the thumb is the flow, and then the way the fingers curl 
is the magnetic field. And if I turn my thumb upside down, it's going to flow a different way. And now you can do that in VR and have the vectors and arrows flow with your hand as it moves. So that's pretty cool. Someone's going to design that. <laughs> we might do it next year, but if we don't, God love you. Anyone go out there and make that. Next slide. Yeah, so what is so special about 3D, right? Like, I mean, there's lots of great 2D content made on a PC. Should all that 2D content just be ported straight to 3D? Put out a heart if you think that's true. Ah, oh, it's a savvy audience. No hearts here. Because, yeah, I mean, some content is done perfectly well in 2D. Why spend the extra money? It's expensive, as you know, to make 3D content, right? So why do that? I think. I think 3D and VR should be saved for the content that is well done in 3D and VR. And so this is an example of, it's really hard to see, sorry, but, um, you know, arrows going again in the north and south parts of magnets showing the magnetic field around a bipolar magnet. Like, that's a great use of 3D. Next slide. So I, I, what I'm going to do next is talk you through a few studies that have been done, um, randomized control trials. And as you look at those, ponder what are the best uses of immersive VR, given, again, that's more expensive than 2D development. And so, you know, what do we want to see going forward for education in VR using natural interfaces with the hands and hand controllers? Next slide. I'll just start with an older study uh, done by Gutierrez in 2008. They were training medical students on traumatic brain injury. They had two conditions, a VR HMD, like an old school heavy headset, and then a flat, what they called flat screen, which some people call desktop or PC. I like to call it PC because it's shorter, but you know what I'm talking about, just on a monitor. Um, and they always hold the content constant. So it's the same stuff you're learning in the VR HMD, you're learning that on a desktop as well. They found significant effects for learning that favored the VR group, right? And that's kind of what I would expect, just because I'm someone who likes VR so much. They did a really interesting dependent variable. The DV was um, a card sorting task. So the participants who were medical students would uh, take cards with ideas and sort them into piles. And if they did it more like an expert doctor did, an expert MD, then they were considered to have learned more. So it's kind of an old school thing that cognitive psychologists have done before, but I, I don't see it often in studies like this, so I just wanted to bring attention to that. Like, there's lots of ways to get at the idea of learning, right? Most people do pre and post tests with declarative knowledge. That's what we did in the study, but um, this one they did card sorting tasks. So, next slide. That's an old study and now looking at the recent stuff that's come out with the new spate of headsets um honestly guys it's like mixed results right it's kind of all over the place so i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to you about the three different ways it can come out it can come out either favoring the uh, vr condition or the pc condition or they can be equal so i'm gonna focus on stem here and i'm only going to talk about the rigorous rcts that happen and those, these are people who know how to run studies they have good control groups uh, people are randomly assigned and so those are the ones i'm focusing on next slide uh, this is a re recent one by crocos on spatial memory again two conditions immersive vr with an oculus dk2 and they compared it to a pc condition the dependent variable was spatial memory for famous faces. I think they had about 30 faces that would show up in different places around this, you know, memory palace. The results were significantly better on recall of the faces for the VR group. So maybe you would expect that with something spatial, huh? Next slide. So these next studies showed no difference. This is one by Madden et al. called Ready Learner One. We love that name, don't we? And um, they had three conditions. They had a hands-on condition where the uh, participant is actually holding, I think it's a styrofoam ball, and moving it around a light, okay? Because they're learning about phases of the moon. The second condition, they are actually uh, sitting on a PC and looking at a simulation of that. And I think they're interacting as well with the mouse. 
And in the third condition, they're in an Oculus Rift with the bimanual hand controls, and they're able to move uh, the sun around. What are they doing? They're moving the moon around the sun. No, they're moving the moon around the earth, and the sun is visible. And uh, it's a fully immersive, you know, Oculus Rift situation. The dependent variable was declarative learning. So how much do you know about this moon phase knowledge? And actually the results were interesting. There were no significant differences in moon phase knowledge uh, between the uh, PC and hand control and actually uh, with the physical condition as well, right? So everyone's learning the same. There was some interesting uh, interaction with gender by amount of game playing. Now, it was, it was interesting side because it was two thirds female. And so there weren't that many males in there, but all the males who were in the study had a lot of gaming experience and were used to um, moving around in like PCs and also more comfortable with the, the Oculus Rift setup. And uh, I think the boys learned more. So that was sort of an interesting thing. When you run these studies, you should be looking at your gender effects and looking at amount of time in gaming and, and uh, and also, if it's a science domain, looking at number of semesters or, or how much previous science as well. So to keep all that tidy. All right, so this was a good study by uh, people at Cornell showing no difference in learning. Next slide. This was a recent study. It's a dissertation defense now, but will hopefully be published in the next 10 months or so. Um, again, he had three conditions. One that's called low, medium, and high immersivity. In the low immersive situation, there's no interactivity. Um, the participants are watching a video and doing some reading about lab safety. In the mid immersivity condition, they're on a 2D PC platform and they're manipulating the content with a mouse. And then in the high one, they're in a daydream VR and they're manipulating with uh, the single hand controller. The content was lab safety, and that was developed by Labster, if you know them. Um, you know, it was actually not explicitly 3D content. So the lab safety stuff, it's a lot of declarative knowledge. It's not so contingent on spatial and three-dimensionality. So that's just one of my points that I like to make. When you're making content for VR, you should be working in a domain that's highly spatial. That's where you're going to get most bang for your buck, okay? So this is a slide of uh, Dr. Spies' data and, oh my God, I can't even read it. I got to turn around. Here we go. Ah, Pre-test, they're totally matched. At post-test, you see that the high and mid level, the PC and VR are doing better. And by follow-up, those gains are maintained. So that's sort of interesting. I guess in the end, I would say that this study found no difference between PC and VR. Next slide. So here's a study, um, I find it a bit anomalous, that favored the desktop condition over VR. And so give me a heart if you've read this study, the mccransky mayer study. And by the way, I have these all at the very end of this talk. I have a, a references slide with all these studies mentioned and where they were post, where they came out. So you, you can look at that. Hopefully we're gonna publish these slides. I don't know, is that right? Will presenter slides be published? You can share them if you if, want. Yeah, all right, I'd like to share that. And if not, and if you can't find them, just email me at mina.johnson at asu.edu. Oh, I hope I put my I hope I put my email up there somewhere. If I didn't, you can find me. Happy to share all this with you guys. All right, so here's the McCransky study, which I found fascinating when it came out. I'm like, there's something I gotta go deeper in this and figure it out. So here, here's what I know about this study. They had two conditions. Um they had uh ooh, that they were counterbalanced. So they had, so when something's counterbalanced, it means that participants did both. They were in the PC first and second in the VR, or they were either in the VR first and second in the PC. So they went through both kind of situation and um, they were randomly assigned to that. They were in a Samsung Gear VR, same content in both, again, designed by Labster. The results, exact knowledge gains favored the, uh, the PC condition, but they were not significant. 
um, the first time around. It was only the second time around when they were in that headset. They also did something interesting. They, they got um, EEG data with 16 sensors on the skull. So they were getting some EEG waves and looking at those patterns, they were able to deduce if they had higher or lower cognitive load. So that was one of the first studies to do that. So that was pretty cool. Participants who were first in the PC condition and then put into VR displayed EEG results that looked like cognitive overload, but that was only during the second exposure, right? When people in the VR condition were in the first exposure, they didn't show that. And so what this says to me is that perhaps there are fatigue effects over time. The first time, so this means like the first 20 minutes you're in the VR headset, you're doing fine. It's not like you're looking more fatigued than PC. But by the time you go in there a second time in the same day of the study, you're having a different, you know, EEG signature that is equated with, with cognitive overload. So I just want to, you know, if anyone ever says to you, oh, people in VR don't learn as much because the McCransky study shows this, you need to say, well, it didn't the first time they were in a headset, but it did the second time. I think that's an, uh, an important fact. Next slide. The other thing you should know about this study is, you know, if you've ever been in gear, uh, it, this was an early version of the gear. And so the way that you maneuvered around this environment, this lab environment, was by, by, by pushing the um, headset, you know, there's the four controls on the headset, and so there were no hand controls, it wasn't even a mouse, it was the touchpad on the side of the HMD. And they even admit in the article that the specific advantages of immersive VR were not optimized, that it was an unintuitive controller, so I think we would all agree with that, and you know, the tech has moved on since then. But hats off to them for doing this study early on. Next slide. So this was a meta-analysis done by Radianti, recently published. You know, just sort of claiming that there's a dearth of learning outcome studies, and I feel that as well. I mean, I really had to comb to find these seven studies or so. It's a common lament that learning theories are often not included in these articles as they write up application development. And also the evaluation of educational applications has mainly focused on usability and not on learning outcomes. So I'm just making a call that we need more of those out there, my friends. If you're working with VR in the schools, please do a learning outcome study as well. Next slide. So now I'm gonna focus on a study that we just finished in my lab, um, like literally just finished. And so we're writing it up now. It's not published, but hopefully it will be in a few months. It's based on a free game that's actually now in the Oculus store called Catch a Mimic. Um, it teaches about natural selection. It's very embodied in that kids are holding a net and they're catching butterflies with the net. Uh, it just came out yesterday in uh, Greek, Spanish, and French, so we're excited about that. So if anyone wants to use that as an experiment to make a comparison with localized languages or even to make the comparison with 2D versus 3D, um, I have that in 2D that can be played in WebGL, and also now clearly it's in um, 3D VR in the Go and Rift formats. Next slide. So this was naive of me to put um, my trailer link here thinking I could like click on the link and show you the trailer. Wait, what's happening? Oh my God, I clicked on the link. Okay, it's just going to the next slide. But yeah, we're not gonna try to play the trailer now, but it's just a 50 second trailer. Please feel free to look that up at embodiedgames.com. So I guess just quickly to tell you about the game, you're catching certain butterflies and their patterns are changing as the levels get harder and we're teaching you about mimicry. So how do butterflies mimic non, how do the non-poisonous butterflies begin to mimic the poisonous butterflies? So it's very engaging, it's super short, like just eight minutes, kind of made for fourth graders on up. And we turn this into a study. So it's a two by two by three design. 100, uh, 219 undergraduates have gone through a we had um, two factors, and each factor had two levels. So factor one, with active embodiment, you were either catching the butterflies with the net by moving your hand around, either with the mouse or using the hand controller and the go headset, or you were on a PC and you were either, and you were just watching playback. If you're in low embodiment condition, you're just watching the playback on the screen. 
The second factor was immersivity, and that was either low, being in a PC, or high, being in an Oculus Go VR situation. So again, low would just be on a laptop PC, and high would be in the Go. Next slide. So just kind of quickly through the post-test means here, we're just in the middle of analyzing this, but you can see by the means, it's sort of interesting that um, in the low embodied PC, they actually do okay, right? If they're just watching the video, people catching butterflies, they're learning a lot about natural selection. If they're in the high embodied PC, it goes down a little. That's not statistically significantly different, but it's not as good. And then when they're in the low embodied VR, they really don't do that well. They do the best, you won't be surprised, in the high embodied VR condition. So those were the greatest gains, and they did significantly better there than the low embodied VR. Next slide. Let me show you what that looks like in a graph. I really hadn't predicted this, that the worst condition would be the high embodied VR. And why might that be? We'll go to the next slide there. We don't have to look at little numbers on the screen. That's crazy. All right, so here the bold red line is showing you how they did. They all started the same at pre-test. Yay, we like to see that. And then by post-test, the high embodied VR is significantly lower. I'm sorry, the low embodied VR is significantly lower than the high embodied VR group. So they really kind of, everyone came up, of course, they're all learning more, but uh, that group came up less. And so you're really being sort of penalized. You're doing worse if you're in the go, in, if you're in the Go headset and you're not able to use the net and use your body and gesture, you, you suffer, you do worse than if you were in a high body condition. You actually even do worse than PC. So that was sort of fascinating. Next slide. And what that says to me is that when you're passively watching content in a 2D space on a PC, that might be okay, right? But when you're in virtual reality and you have the expectation of control and agency, then it's very infelicitous for learning. You're not going to learn as much. And so as we go forward designing VR curriculum, we should be thinking about the affordances of VR and taking care of, of what it does well and what the expectations of the user are. So if you have a hand control in your hand and you're expecting to be able to move it around and catch butterflies, you better make sure that your participants can do that or they're not going to learn as much. Next slide. So I think I want to end tonight um, by talking quickly about a uh, quality rubric that we've designed. Because I think teachers really want this, right? They, you know, with more VR content becoming available for education, they want to know what's the, what are the better quality modules out there, which ones work and which ones don't, and which ones did, did people like. And so this is just a rubric that we designed. Um, uh, I'm going to send it out as a, it's a chapter that'll, that's due this summer. But, before, but even before that, it's here on the Embodied Games website, embodied-games. And if you go to Blog Tools, you can download this 20-item rubric. Next slide. And I don't know why I torture you by putting this tiny little font up here, but it kind of looks like this, right? It's just sort of a 20 item, 21 items designed just for educators. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not too intense. I have a few pages behind it that talk about what each uh, item is and the research behind why each item was put in there. You would score the module anywhere from a zero to three. And then that's normalized to come out to be around 100%. So, you know, whatever module you go through is going to come out to be anywhere from like a 50 to 100 on this rubric scale. Quiver, quality of education in virtual reality rubric. So please feel free to use that and please give me feedback on it because we just keep wanting to make it better and better and more useful. Maybe 20 items is too much, right? Maybe it should just be 13. So if you all want to help me figure out how to make it tighter, I would really appreciate that feedback. Next slide. Oh my gosh, that went really quick. Oof, hope I didn't talk too fast. But I think I'll open this up for questions and um, would love to hear from you after this as well. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone, please give Nina a round of applause. Eee.
thank you. Lots of claps. Yee, hearts. <laughs> this is such a fun space to present in. Thank you. <laughs> next slide. You can see the references. Next slide, I think. Cool. So, Mina, would you like to answer some questions then? I would, yeah. I'd love to. Okay, everyone in the audience. So if you look on your bottom right hand of your screen, you should see a raise hand button. So what you're gonna do is if you have a question, raise that hand and then we're gonna call on you. So let's start off with uh, Mark Anster. You're on megaphone. Hi, Mark. Oh, I can't hear it though. Do I need to take something off? No. Mark, can you try muting, unmuting yourself? Okay, well, we can't hear you, but if you are able to fix your audio, we can come back to you. Let's are you sure you clicked to... on Mark? Are you sure you clicked on Mark? Because I'm able to unmute myself suddenly. Oh, okay. Go yes. ahead and ask your question. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, it's a comment. Uh, basically, number one, I wanted to uh, express appreciation for what you've done because um, this is number one. The whole system is great, but number two, you you're trying to quantify things, which I think is great. But here's here's where I'm coming down to. Um, I'm try trying to. Oops. Oh, just bailed for a second. Um, I um, I have an example, if you will. Um, Diary of Anne Frank. That's uh, on the quest, right? Let's just say yeah. that I took, let's say that I went through there and I remembered virtually nothing from having watched it. But if I had a bunch of um, index cards, I remember 25% of the facts. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to read a bunch of index cards. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a quality to the fact that it is a V, a v not VR necessarily, but it's, it's a video or a VR or something else that makes a person at least get 5% or 2% that they wouldn't have gotten in any other case. Nobody's going to sit there and, uh, if you follow what I'm saying, nobody's going to go and get the index cards in to, to read about, you know, submarine problems, but they might watch a video. <laughs> you know? So, so there's a, there's a really, a, an odd thing about, uh, uh the learn what constitutes the learning. And by the way, there's one, one extra thing, by the way, and that is the, any of these may have been, in my mind, um, might have been even more powerful if one of them allowed you to ask questions. If each of them is simply presentation only, no. that's a really mm -hmm. odd way to yeah. learn, right? No, what if I could true. ask you a yeah, clarification a question? Yeah, <laughs> so, so this is this is where I think it's combinations of things. And, and anyway, basically that's my thought is that it, you can get too detailed in things, you'd find out that learning about Atomic energy is great in VR, but learning about uh, Earth isn't. <laughs> I mean, that's odd. Well, uh, so so let me answer this. I you know I um, I like that you brought up the Anne Frank house because it's <laughs> an emotional experience. And uh, under presence, I would put emotionality and empathy, and then I skip over all that, don't I? Like I give it short shrift. So I sort of wanted to put that up front that because I'm interested in STEM, I don't do a lot with emotion and presence. And I think that going through the Anne Frank house gives you, well, I've only been in, in real life, uh, not in VR, but I think it does give you this sense of like, oh my God, these people like hid in the attic and it's pretty intense. So there are things that can be learned in a spatial VR experience that are emotional that I don't touch on at all here. And um, yeah, I mean, look, your point is taken about that. I'm also, also only focusing on this sort of declarative knowledge and you can learn that with with flashcards, but why, why would you? <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think that we've got a lot of opportunities and I'm going to guess also that, I don't mean to uh, grab everything here, but um, the different people learn different ways. I mean, I'm in software development and I have trained any number of people and some people don't get it. And I'm not sure that they don't get it. I'm sure that I haven't thought of the right way to get it into their brain. Right. <laughs> Just as long as you don't say visual and verbal learners, because we know that's been we're, that's been disabused. There's no such thing as a visual learner or a verbal learner. It's like everyone 
can learn the content might be uh, might be presented better in a visual or verbal format, but there's no such thing as learners who only learn in one different one specific way. So, I always have to make sure to say that. Sounds good. But yeah, th things yeah. should be pre presented in multiple ways. Yeah. Thanks. Another question. I can sort of hear you. Maybe if you that shout. Better? Yeah, that's better. Now? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, so you've, you've presented so much wonderful quantitative research today. And uh, it seems like you have a lot of experience in the field. And I'd love to just hear uh, one of your qualitative moments where you, you saw uh, a participant uh, really, something really click for them uh, learning through VR. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, well, I mean, isn't it so fun to see their little faces light up when you put the headset on them? Like you can't see their eyes, but they smile and they're into it. And so the game we made, you know, you're moving your body and you're looking at these beautiful butterflies and like the kids just start to walk forward and, and move their hands around and try to capture them in, in the net and they're just into it so into it in a way that they're not when they're reading a book like if you're reading a book about the wing pattern changes like it's just not the same thing as being you know taking on the role of a zookeeper and catching these butterflies so i just you know i can see that their face and their bodies sort of light up as they learn and um you know another thing that we like to do as experimental psychologists is give a, a straw man condition like a reading condition right but i didn't even bother with that because i know they're going to learn more on a pc which is also a pretty and fun looking game even though it's 2d versus the the vr and so if i have them like just reading text like a book about you know mimicry it's it's just yeah i know they're not going to learn as much or be as excited or be as engaged so I sort of like seeing that aha moment, and um, yeah, sure we've all sort of seen that. I see a question up there. Bill, I guess the moderators are, open you up. You're next. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to go on microphone. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, great. Okay. Um, that, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I, too, appreciate quantitative testing and so on. Um, I work in Virginia. I run a, a computer club. And one of the projects we just did in 2018, 2019, was work with the National Park Service to develop a virtual reality sim of the Grand Canyon for the centennial. And oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah, and talk about spatial reasoning, we did it on the rip. Yeah. But the really cool thing we did was um, we, we worked in Unity, and we mapped the y-axis to the elevation on the rip, uh, on, in the canyon. So we were able to map all the formations. So as you're flying around uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, it's displaying uh, things like the geology, the formations, the geologic age, what kind of fossils are there. I, I've actually gone down in the canyon, and I think I learned more flying around. Uh, it was a very similar experience because you do get that sense of spatial, um, the magnitude of the canyon, but you also get to learn a lot about the geology. We're also doing it with history sims. We just did one on Selma, Alabama, where kids built Selma, Alabama, and the bridge, and you're actually walking under the bridge like you were uh, a civil war, uh, one of the African American archers there. So you get a very uh, sort of gut feeling about what it was like across the bridge. Would you want to do it? You could ask what if questions. I mean, it just seems like there's so many possibilities with virtual reality or just doing it on a computer. Your, yeah. your thoughts on well, that? Yeah, I do. I have two questions for you, actually. And one is um, when you are flying around the Grand Canyon, like are you worried about the velocity of the person? Because, I mean... You know, when we made the butterfly game, we thought about you being a bird and swooping down and capturing the butterflies, and then it would, the idea was like, no, that's just going to make you nauseous. And I've been on magic carpet type things, and it's just, it's not fun. So I made this very sensitive to the proprioceptive system where you're just standing still and moving your arm. Um, so I was nervous to make people fly. So if you had any problems with that. No, I haven't. In fact, uh, we can control the speed 
basically I create we create our own first person controller. So we were able to put in we can put in uh, variables to control the speed with which you're going up and down the y axis. The big one but was turn. The, per the person can control, but the person can control it as well, right or no? Right. Yes. Uh, basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, that's good. We mapped the uh, we mapped the going up and down to the trigger buttons on the Rift controller. Yeah. Uh, but I'm saying, but you cap it, it so that they can't go too fast. That you cap it. Yes. Right? Actually, yeah, the big thing we sense. found was the turning speed was what was really making just people nauseous. Uh, uh huh. That makes so we sense too. Yeah. Yeah, so we had to cap that and slow it down on uh, some of the simulations. Yeah, and the other thing More about so Selma is, yeah, it, the other thing about Selma is that it's it's a wonderful example what you said about the um, the empathy and the the presence. And you know, I mean, one thing I want to caution people who are doing history is like just make sure you don't traumatize the students, right? Like it's yeah. so intense, so. Well, that's, yeah, that, just, we had a discussion of that. I talked to the history teachers, and I said, "With you can do this multiplayer. You can actually have um, where you can pick up clubs and have people hit each other virtually. That right? can't physically harm them." The teach the teachers drew the line there and said, "No, we're yeah, just going to no, go no, with no. historical." No, oh, that makes yeah. me nervous too. Yeah, it's yeah, just like, yeah. I'm yeah, just saying yeah. it's interesting what's possible with the technology as to what we should be doing. Super interesting. Maybe we need like an ethics board, like a rubric for ethics of of VR for education. Because I, I, you know, I could see a parent being very upset if a kid comes home. I have two kids, and they said, "Oh, today I took a club and beat, you know, someone in VR." It's just sure it'd be fun, but is it right? <laughs> like you know, when I got my first bullet in Super Hot, I was like, "Oh my God, I don't like this at all." Yeah. Oh, there's another question. Uh, actually, so now we will have to uh, switch to the next speaker. So everyone, please give me the uh, one last round of applause. Thank you, guys. This was fun. Appreciate it. See you again, and, hopefully. And Mina, if you wanted to continue answering some questions, we have a portal in the back over here. And okay. if you follow that and anyone Good. in the audience and I wanna... who still wants to talk with her, you can go ahead, go to the portal, which should go to our social lounge. Otherwise, next up, we and stay will in have... here. The next speaker as well. That'll be great. Yep, our next speaker will be coming up very shortly. So sit tight, everyone. Uh, portal.